Nice, very nice. Welcome everyone. Here's the gang. This is our um, inaugural session. We are the group of people, like-minded people, uh, very highly uh, skilled, uh, ambitious, and um, eager to start the ball rolling. What we are after here, I think, after discussing with each one of you individually, we want to look at ways to maybe uh, kick the ball and start making some breakthroughs because we all, at one point or another, feel that our profession is kind of stuck in a rut. We keep reinventing the wheel. We keep discovering things from the past and then packaging them like a, a new, shiny, exciting new thing. And it's like, come on, it's been, it's all these hills. Uh, I've been reaching to our uh, luminaries, the older colleagues. And uh, as Marcus knows, uh, we, we were trying to get in touch with them to push the envelope, but they seem reluctant or whatever. They're in a comfort zone and they're doing fine. And that's that's okay. <laughs> we have no problem. <laughs> anyway, here today, I just wanna start from saying, first of all, um, Viktor Frankl, uh, who is a famous author and I think he's a psych psychologist. He said that the meaning of life is to give life meaning. <laughs> for me personally, I'm giving my life meaning by connecting with people like you. And you make me think, and thinking makes my life very meaningful. If I'm not thinking, my life is going nowhere. And so I believe most of you are also on the same page. You like thinking, you like challenge, you like taking tough problems and to see how far <laughs> you get. And we are very experimental. And we all, um, you know never leave any stone unturned. Whatever it is, I'm gonna examine it. As Socrates said, unexamined life is not worth living. So we are here examining things. <laughs> so what I wanna first uh, mention from, from my perspective, and then I'll open the floor for you guys to uh, jump in and uh, elaborate. Um, I think everything started, our entire uh, civilization basically started with the invention of the Gutenberg printing press. This was the very decisive moment in history when we switched from manual to mass production. So all of a sudden, if you wanted to multiply and propagate books and texts, you don't have to rewrite them, copy them manually. You can use the printing press. And that started the whole avalanche of industrial revolution, you know, um, telecommunications, um, computers, in, uh, you know, and everything else that where we are today. But um, as fantastic as it is, and without that, we wouldn't be here today. I feel that it also has a downside. And to me, the downside is that it reduces everything in our universe down to a, a rectangle, a rectangular flat surface with some symbols on it. So I think we are, sh we are really uh, cutting ourselves down to a, a uh, phenomenally small size by, by sticking to that rectangular flat surface. And if we look at software, for example, all it does is basically mimic that piece of paper. We have digitized paperwork. Big deal. <laughs> yeah, it's great. <laughs> but I mean, to me, it's not much of an accomplishment in the past 60 years. All we did is like just manage to somehow digitize. Uh, we have electronic documentation. We are sending things via emails and whatnot. And I'm pretty sure in the future, I don't know when this is gonna be, but people will look back at right now what we are doing and view it with the same way we view Morse code and telegrams. You know, <laughs> it, we're, I think we are in a very primitive state. And that's why I have high hopes in the younger generation, your brain power, to have the energy and to have the daring to push and make a breakthrough out of that because we are stuck in a two-dimensional flat surface. Okay, it's a glassy surface, but nonetheless. Um, and if we imagine ourselves like being two-dimensional beings, we live in the world of two dimensions, and now we wanna break into the third dimension. Sometimes when I talk about these things, people think I'm talking about destroying this legacy. But you know, if you're, if you're moving from two dimension to three dimension, you're not eliminating two dimensions. You retain two dimensions and you enhance them by the third dimension. Yep. So us moving forward, we will retain everything. It's gonna be 
electronic paper work and whatnot, but we need more. We need to address other capabilities. Now, in particular, what I'm interested in is replacing authority with evidence. Right now, our society is based on blind faith in authority. But uh, some, somebody comes with a piece of paper, there's a stamp and somebody's signature, and that's it. I'm not convinced. I don't believe in authorities. Show me the evidence. But the evidence has been like, no, no, don't you worry about it. This, what you see here is what all you need to know. I, I don't like that. And I think as a society, we need to mature and grow, go beyond that flat piece of paper where somebody put a signature, Mr. President, and he goes like this. It means nothing to me, right? So anyway, I think software can help us get out of that uh, rut, out of the doldrum. Um, now I wanna open the floor to see if you guys have any fertile ideas or we can just stick around brainstorm or chat. You, 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 if you feel like you can change the topic. <laughs> okay, who's gonna step up? I think, uh, Go ahead. Yeah, I, maybe I can <laughs> add to yes. that. Uh, I, I think that the reasoning is, uh, I, I agree to that, but like, I'm thinking that um, to tackle that the entire problem, I think we can start with um, where the entire thing comes into play. For example, the software. Today, uh, I feel like many people are just jumping into the software because the entrance barrier is pretty low and uh, you know we are in demand. I mean, software professionals are in demand more than ever. And then it's super easy to, you know, just learn something and like uh, not even really know what you are getting into and then start getting experience. But like, we are not, uh, I think that's the, 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 the wrong approach, I would say. Uh, I mm -hmm. think that the, the, the more proper approach would be if like the industry requires some standards or like some, how to say some, you know, m more sort of practices and things, things like that, that everybody will have to, uh, follow in order to you know do do the do do the job the right way do the job you know as we should because imagine like in a, in everything almost in in, in our lives let, let's say you are you want to pass a driving exam you have to you know get some practice in order and learn the rules um, so the the same basically should be happening here I'm not sure well, that we have any rules right now in, in the software industry. So, um, and maybe that's the, the, the flexibility that we're having. There are no laws, there are no, you know, um, how to say, um, no boundaries published yeah. or protocols yeah. or something like that, that, you know, will define um, what is the proper way of doing the things. Mm -hmm. So maybe we have to start from somewhere there because like, okay, we have an evidence of like, I don't know, 50 years, how we, we, we are basically failing in, the, in, in this thing. And then maybe somebody will have to come and say, okay, this is not the right thing. You know, maybe we have to start changing the things. And because as I said, like, uh, as you said, we are sort of young professionals and stuff. We are flexible to try new things. And I, and I, I don't have problems with, you know, like just seeing different opinions and try out things. I have a different opinion for you. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I, I have a big problem with, um, processes which define the input instead of predicates which uh, specify the output. And I personally, I personally think that what made software attractive for me was that nobody actually cares on how you achieve a specific result as long as you achieve it. And I'm actually explicitly not advocating for quick and dirty cowboy style code here. And um, my, if we, and initially Alex said, I do not want this piece of paper, but if we only focus on you have shown the pain tolerance to go through a specific process, then we're just replicating that piece of paper with a signature and without improving anything. So I'm, I'm really worried about some kind of programmer's license or whatever. What instead would, in my opinion, work much better is to increase the risk of shitty software in production. And uh, this can go with legislation, which makes sure that data breaches are significantly more punitively handled, handled by, uh, by the authorities. This can, um, be, uh, this can be a direct payment to customers whose data has been leaked and you can qualify the debt of the personal identifiable information with a direct payment. So if you lose an address, it's 100 euro. If you, use, if you lose a credit card, it's 300 euro. And that way, we, we have this predicate on the outcome. 
in, indirectly, obviously, we do not specify any kind of coverage criteria that way. But as, as soon it's actually economically important to not deliver shit, we will not deliver shit anymore. But we shouldn't define we shouldn't define processes like okay, this is a state approved waterfall process, a state approved agile, whatever that will just be return in a through. Then, then we we already have enough fake compliance. We already have enough fake checkboxes where people just uh, still so today i get um, customers getting audited for aws yes you need to enable this a uh, this server-side encryption for the s3 bucket uh, but it doesn't matter the, the threat vector is it's encrypted in a disk at amazon so the only thing it prevents is actually somebody stealing the disk so it's like it's like so um and so and the and I see it's every industry before us. So you can see medical profession. So you see lots of ritualized knowledge. So it, it goes up to a specific local optimum. Then legislation comes in, nails this down forever. And then basically you cannot ever leave this local optimum. You cannot be woe into something better simply because um, businesses will align and uh, institutional education will align and then we are stuck. And I think that getting stuck is inevitable. The only thing is I do not want to get stuck on our current processes. So, um, and uh, hence, if we, if we have to do more formalism, let's just go economics, just increase the price of failure. And that will, that will transitively improve the situation much more and still leave enough flexibility for creativity than to mandate a specific kind of process. So you are into more uh, reactive model. I don't think it's reactive. Let me I don't think like it's reactive. More like once the damage like, is done, they get punished. No, no, no. The, 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 the best, all businesses I've ever worked with have to factor in the risk of failure. And when the risk of failure is low, then they can, then they naturally, because they are actually, they're custodians of the investor's money. And I, I don't actually blame them for the status quo. It's just they, they have all incentive to cut corners on stuff we consider is important. And right now, even all users of the systems we provide are losing face because we allowed ourselves to cut corners. If we just change the risk equation to make any kind of breach significantly more important. Right now, it's national news if Equifax gets cracked. Good, great. But uh, uh, the, pro the, the project, still, uh, the, the company still exists, in my opinion, should have been burned down yeah. and um, financially. And if, if more of these examples exist, then people will actually care. Let me ask you this, and then I'll shut up and let other talk. Um, let's compare with the car industry. Today, you let's say you manufacture a new brand of car. You cannot put it on the market without airbags, right? Can't. That's, that's it, great. Granted, like, you can't. No, nobody will allow you to. What if uh, in, in software, for example, what do you think? Because you are the ex domain expert. If you, if you cannot launch your um, product, if it has surviving mutants. That's a good idea, but that assumes that uh, if we codify that, people will optimize for um, uh, for making mutants unsurvivable, potentially remove 99% of all operators, only have one operator left, and then you still have no surviving mutants, you game the system. And the only way to approach this is via, via, via increasing the, 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 the business has to weigh cost versus risk. And the only way we can we can actually achieve the result we are after is increasing risk because if as soon as we formalize any kind of metric it will be gained okay yeah i agree mm -hmm. okay let's hear other and what yeah I, I agree with what you said totally and uh, you are spot on with this but i think also uh, the problem comes from the fact that somehow generally the developers and also the customer we are we are pleased with the with the solution and not not about the quality of course we are not pleased about the quality but we uh, we are pleased with the solution that we solve a problem and we can see day by day year by year we are solving more and more more uh, complex uh, problem domains and uh, so we are getting somewhere but somehow we are still stuck so somehow we are in a comfortable shoes a comfortable situation okay we are doing fine we are keep improving keep producing better and better softwares i mean for solving more and more complex uh, problems but somehow uh, of course the quality is still uh, not yes. place very yeah but but isn't that just an encoding of the risk i mentioned earlier that that's the risk of producing shit quality doesn't matter right now it matters absolutely, absolutely. So, yeah, so that's what so, I'm saying. I'm just, just somehow, yeah, somehow. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. 
Yeah, so so what I meant here that we are uh, uh, fixing fixing more uh, the problems, eh? So and year by year and more and more problems and kind of we are efficient. Eh? You can see the software change. Software has uh, changed a lot of people's life. Uh, it improves a lot of people's lives. So we are making a big impact with software. And somehow the people tend to be comfortable. We are kind of become uh, became comfortable with the state of the art. So that's why we are stuck in this uh, two-dimensional uh, uh, layer somehow. I think that's my opinion. But so it, of course, I, it's just one of the reasons. So yeah, that's what you just said. Uh, you just said uh, the bar is very low to enter. Anything you do, I, wow, you know, it's easy to impress. But we all know that this is barely scratching the surface. So here we are. With I think. Uh, yeah, I also like. Uh, uh the the, the reasoning uh, from um what was the name um marcus M -B -J. marcus, marcus. Yeah, it's my, uh, my full name is marcus like... bertold josef so it turned into my nickname <laughs> over the years oh. so yeah sorry yeah uh if i got him correctly he's saying like we have to be more responsible towards the actions that we do so for example if you if you're more conscious and more responsible for like shipping crap Right. If you know that there will be like that, that, that you have to, you know, take some responsibility if, if shit yep. happen, then uh, maybe I, I don't. I mind. don't. If I if I got you correctly. No, yeah. I don't think so. I don't think you got me correctly because I think that the change will not happen until shitting crap is more risky, because you you can as a single person never. I, I've tried for for years and. Um, and I had to realize you can never win against the average. And the average has only ever been moved by large scale business decisions. And you have to influence the business decisions which hire people like us. You cannot, you cannot as a single person or as a group of people change the industry unless you change the global variables. And the global variables is just risk versus reward. Increase the risk, then uh, increase the risk, then the software will get better, keep it like Current, where basically the all end users have to accept that their data was was stolen, or um, then nothing nothing will fundamentally change. And the only thing we can do is for our pleasure to improve our craft, which I love doing, and I sell tools which help you to do this. But um, you will not substantially affect the industry, and maybe we have to face the fact that it's good enough. So in, in the end, it's all um, ideas are just uh, are just hypotheses for the evolutionary process. Maybe our ideas to improve the base quality are not warranted because the risk is actually just as it should be. Maybe maybe, maybe our wish to increase the risk in the industry to improve better quality is just uh, not required because we are already might already be at an equilibrium, who knows? Well, that depends, I think, on exactly what kind of software you're talking about. For like the classical huge risk things like avionics, embedded medical devices, and as you were talking about earlier, large financial systems like say Equifax. Uh, yeah, definitely we need to be uh, keeping quality top of mind at all times. But yeah, you know, some silly little web app that uh, you know, Facebook for squirrels or uh, who really cares? So maybe Let's welcome Jan and Dave joined us. And I apologize, I, I didn't react in time. You were waiting too long because we were so just to, to um, uh, set the stage for you guys. We're talking about um, the need to have some breakthrough in our industry because we've been going in circles for about 60 years. Uh, and snake oil salespeople selling us stuff that has been invented back in the 60s, like ta da, this is the latest and the greatest. And we are yeah, really going back to Lisp. <laughs> slowly devolving back to this, we are devolving back to 1958. Should and, I do uh, that? I, I don't see that as progress, to be honest with you. And then we talked about the, uh, the whole thing started happening after the invention of the Gutenberg uh, printing press that started this avalanche of industrial revolution, telecommunications and all that, which is basically going, moving away from uh, handcrafting to mass produced and mass distribution. And here we are today, internet is a giant copy machine and you can copy anything you want and send it anywhere you want at, in blink of an eye, right? But all we had actually, we've accomplished is just electronic paper. We're just mimicking the old paper, which is just the opposite. It is not much, but I don't see any real breakthrough there. And so here's a, a bunch of very smart people 
And same as back in 20 years ago, there was a bunch of young, youngish people like you are guys got together, created Agile Manifesto. We are inventing better ways working, blah, blah, blah. Here we are today. I think there's another need for a pent up demand for brilliant young people with a lot of energy, like Marcus has a lot of energy. Marcus, you're working like crazy, right? I, I know you. Uh, to push, to break through, to, to like, you know, reinvent the whole paradigm. You know, it's a paradigm shift to get away from this rectangular flat surface with some symbols on it. And we, we distill or we reduce our entire lives, the entire wealth of our universe to this rectangular piece of paper or rectangular glassy surface where we have some symbols, a few pictures of cats or something. That's really, you know, the I believe. So we need to spread our wings and we need to um, go into other dimensions and use all faculties with, you know, sensory input, touching, you know, having a spatial feeling and also getting away from this fake authority where somebody gives you a piece of paper with a stamp and signature and this is evidence. That's not evidence. We are looking for concrete evidence and we will not accept uh, some fake artifacts as like Mr. President says so and here is the declaration. <laughs> Don't worry, there's no more virus, everything's cool. That's bullshit. So, yeah, yeah, just because we have a great new copy machine doesn't mean that the stuff we're copying is any truer than it was. Yeah, before. exactly. Exactly. We have massive. We have now democratized uh, fake pumping, news, pumping shit out in any whichever direction. I don't see that as a progress. I mean, it, it, it has it has terrible downside, and I think we need to start thinking out of the box. And that's why I'm tr trying to r rally the fort quickly. How do we get out of this doldrum? We're going in circles, chasing our own tail. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, we're seeing other industries just making phenomenal breakthroughs in hardware and everything else, but software is still stuck in this, like, okay, your code is text, and now you're trying to compile and, and delay feedback, and just like Mickey Mouse in my mind. It, it's not, it can't cut the mustard, right? So that's what I want to pr uh, provoke mm -hmm. you guys, or entice you to start thinking about, is there an alternative way that we just don't have to stop um, chasing our own tail and talking about like okay, a clean code or blah. Okay, that's cool. But like, there's got to be more to it. So anyway, over to you guys. Uh, if you have any other ideas or suggestions, or maybe one of the more. question. The question here, I think, is how could we add that uh, next uh, dimension, huh? Because uh, we need we need another factor, huh? You need the freedom. So, for example, I don't know using uh, virtual reality or augmented reality or uh, something like that. So new, we need another dimension. It uh, so that's the and question we, we is what the, can be. What's, what's frustrating? We do have the technology. We do have IoT. We do have nano printing. We do all that. We're just not using it in, in software development. We're using it for other things. But I'm still <laughs> stuck in the editor, and it's like the, the delayed feedback. It just frustrates me to no end. I like immediate feedback, like, because I'm doing other things. Like, for example, I play guitar. Guitar is giving me immediate feedback. I know how far I can push. I know how far I can go. It's telling me right there in split second, what am I doing wrong? Software, not so much. So, Alex, I would yeah, I was I would noticing like the bass in the background. Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I yield push to Marcus. <laughs> Okay, Alex, so the thing is, I, uh, I, I like that you highlight the need for immediate feedback, but we need to really um, differentiate between medium and latency. And um, a two-dimensional screen can encode uh, three-dimensional information because our, our brains are able to project it back into three dimensions, else we wouldn't have 3D games. And uh, I don't think that the medium is as important as the latency aspect of what you just said, so I don't, I, I don't need a nano, nano assembly yeah. display, whatever. Yeah. What what happened? What what is more important for me is if we go into development tooling now, is uh, the latency aspect. And I don't think that um, screens are a very bad local optimum for 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 input into our brains. I I have more problems with uh, typing as the only input me input mechanism into the machine, but. Um, I don't think that that the criticism of the two-dimensional surface is is as you as helpful to to the casual observer of this discussion as this latency and feedback thing. So feedback speed, I totally subscribe, but um, just uh, having this two-dimensional surface doesn't let me clarify doesn't doesn't strike me as the thing which may, which demands immediate action. Whereas latency in software development for feedback is let, let me, let me uh, hundred times more important. 
Yeah, let me clarify. Mm -hmm. I'm not only talking about uh, latency in software development. I'm also talking about the limiting experience of using software. People who are using software by staring at the glassy three-dimensional surface, right? And that also can be uh, improved, right? And so I, I think that in the in the in the real world, there's more use of software outside of people staring at a screen than uh, than people not saying that each time you use a power grid, each time you use a, you use a light switch, uh, you use software because everything depends on software to make that thing work. There's a grid management system. There are thousands of IoT controllers in a power plant and so on and so forth. So I, I don't think, so I'm here to challenge you on that one. I don't think that specific two dimensional thing helps, uh, is, is, should be on the top of our agenda. Let's say it that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, basically one thing that, um, is, was startling to me. There was a point in time when I realized that we have programming languages for all kinds of things, but we don't seem to have, or, or at least uh, uh, mainstream programming languages for programming systems. And systems are way too complex, especially if we're talking about involved systems that you can program them. So we are kind of, kind of crawling through some sewer trying to understand, but nobody can grok it, right? So I think, um, Here's an opportunity also to come up with some kind of a different um, experience when we are talking about systems so that you can maybe demonstrate the, the real size of the system and the real magnitude by not le just looking at, at symbols on can you Can you clarify what kind of system are you are talking about? Because there is the search space for this word is far too wide in my mind right now. Well, any system that has a lot of moving parts and that is event driven okay. and that is non-deterministic and people reach, you quickly reach a point where you just kind of, uh, if you're not using statistics or some modeling, you lose track and you cannot really communicate, right? And it quickly falls apart. And yet we are building very complex systems which none of us can really grok. We're just kind of, kind of intuitively saying, oh, I think this is a bit uh, complex, but nobody really knows, right? So. There's also an opportunity to think about how do we actually master that? Because right now I feel we are in diapers, it's ba baby steps. I'm talking to people about systems and nobody seems to know. They'll be like, well, then something happens over there and all of a sudden there's a lot of moving parts and they're fa fairly complex, right? And while you can certainly master your domain and you're, you're doing your TDD and your mutation testing and your integration, but then when you put everything together, you kind of lose people tend to lose the um, crisp or, or clarity about that system. So th that's also what I'm aiming at is kind of some kind of a system uh, language or system. Oh, I do not, I do not think this is a language issue, but more a library issue. So um, I've been toying with ideas to model an entire system um, down from the value proposition of the cost of the of the company. So it basically, turn your entire process into a direct acyclic graph and say, okay, so in order to make money, we need to have a web shop. In order to have a web shop, we need to have a, a system which uh, we need to receive users' requests. To in order to receive users' requests, you obviously need to open a web socket. So you can break it down from the entire way from from. Um, and but you would encode this entire thing into software, so you wouldn't just stop with your build system in producing a binary, but you you would define lots of abstract targets and encode these all into software. So each time somebody asks, on why are we doing this?" you should be able to break it down to the value proposition of the company automatically via an inverse walking up the direct aesthetic graph of the build system. But the build system would be the entire system, so everything. You would even you would even encode issues in there for stuff you would like to fix in the future. So it would just all be one thing. It's just a, just a thing I've, I've been toying with for a long time. All right, anyone has any other suggestions or thoughts? Well, not so much a suggestion as a thought on this uh, all in one sort of system. That's a uh, fascinating concept, but in my experience, all in one sort of systems where it's like your build system and your issue tracker and this and floor wax and a dessert topping uh, tend not to do 
the individual pieces very well. Just going back I, to I've the never days said of, that it would be implemented in the same thing, but it would be connected to the same graph. So I should be very explicitly here. I wouldn't just replace GitHub action, the GitHub issues if you were using it. But if you were able to to make a full graph, if you have would have would be able to make a full graph and could could justify the existence of every piece of software, every deployment unit, and you could automatically trace it back to the value proposition of the company, you can also automatically prune stuff, which doesn't fall onto the value proposition anymore. Hmm. So perhaps if these pieces were like independent, swappable ways of doing each piece, so like you're um, so I've, your source code. I, it's a, it's a first time I've. GitHub, it's the first time I've whatever. verbalized this idea. Let, let Dave so it's the first time it. I don't use chat to explain it. So and uh, so I obviously failed to do so because I, this is basically the third video call I do in two years, and um, uh, there is I, I I cannot go. I do not think I'm efficiently describing the idea right now. I should probably write a small essay can you, or something. Can you let Dave finish. Yeah, it sounds like a. Good fodder for a blog post or something. For me and blogging is a 10 year old joke, so. Uh, yeah, kind of me too. I've gotten like three different locations where I allegedly have a blog. So uh, <laughs> maybe a dozen posts on each. Uh, well, a dozen to posts total, I think maybe. Um, you anyway, know, where was I? Oh yeah, um, if we could define like some sort of interface between the various pieces just on a conceptual level. So, okay, you take this idea from your like issue tracker and use some sort of conceptually standard interface to go up the up the tree. Could be, could be an encoding of what I'm talking about, yes. Yeah. So, so maybe let's hear Jan, do you have any thoughts? You, you've been quiet. We can't see you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have some thoughts. So I think that um, the software industry is, um, that, um, don't, doesn't really want to, to think outside the box. We, we um, love to, to talk about it, but um, I remember, for example, um, from my college days, um, what, a, what a wow moment was when when a professor presented us that um, three negator elements um, connected um, one after another are much, much faster than a single negator element because of um, parasite capacitances. So um, I think that, that we, we should try to, to, try to um, find another perspectives to, to look on our work and to, to question even the most um, the most ba basic stuff that, that we are used to do. Um, I, for example, am, um, am co-founder of startup and um, I, I always know how much money we have and what's our run rate. So, but um, at some point I, I figured out that um, the, only way to, the only way to survive in this competitive um, industry is to, to find better ways to, um, to do software, um, find a faster ways to deliver. And yeah, I, I, I think that, that sometimes I, I'd say it really helps me that I didn't study computer science, but electrical engineering, because um, I just don't have that, um, that all, all of that patterns um, that deep inside me. Um, and um, I, I many times use um, the ideas that I that I um, got through through my studies um, about electrical engineering. I, I for example, I really love to to watch um, on things as a, as a signals and try to convert them into frequency space. Um, and you can you can do that for for every everything that you um, that you see across and it comes across your path, but um, sometimes the, the only the idea that you, you can transform something from from one place to another, um, which which may seem completely stupid at um, at the beginning, but it can it can really uh, give you um, a better look. So yeah, I think that 
that we should try to we should try to learn more about other industries that that are um, having breakthroughs and um, see what what they are doing and try to i'd say we we should try to to uncomplicate um, our industry and find uh, easier easier ways because i'm sure that um, I'm sure that we can we can come to a point where you can deploy working software without um, without bugs uh, to production in seconds. But yeah, um, unfortunately, we are not there yet. <laughs> but yeah, for example, I I've speeded up our our process and pipelines from the, um, the one deployment um, on two weeks one year ago to several deployments a day to day and pipelines went from 20 minutes to three minutes and a half something like that and i'm not done yet so <laughs> <laughs> I, I need i need to i need to use uh, to use our money wisely so <laughs> yeah great thank you so are we all just getting started yeah yeah <laughs> so just a quick question are we all here in agreement that uh, a new breakthrough is definitely needed and that may be something of a new manifesto or whatever you want to call it as a group of young or, or uh, ambitious aspiring engineers we want to tackle this um, blind alley that i feel we, we're stuck in where we're just we, you know just chasing new frameworks and but not really making much of a progress and if that's the case then let's maybe plan to have another session to kind of see if we can yeah. make it. Yeah, totally. Hey. I agree. Um, I, I think, same as you, that uh, we don't have the, the same restriction about uh, uh, technology uh, comparing with our predecessors, but um, the software industry seems to be stagnate. Uh, we we always talk about the same ten, uh, t topics, TDD, DDD, but um, looking, for example, on, on Twitter, uh, doesn't seem that uh, a lot of people is using it. So, yeah, there is a problem there. So, I, I agree with you. <laughs> thank you. So, we're running out of time now. I want to thank everyone for your brilliant contribution. What is uh, your feeling? What should be when? When should we meet next? What do you think? I think we should, we should also calendar. consider to meet in a communication form, which is more effective, because talking uh, through human language is not my, at least for me, it could be for others, uh, work much better. For me, I consider it quite limiting because it's a semi single duplex shared medium communication form, and I. If I wanted to brainstorm much faster, uh, a group chat box, the information density we just had compared to what I'm used to is maybe 10%. This is not a complaint, but an observation. Okay, let's, let's continue in our channel. Everybody's on the Discord. Mm -hmm. So um, It was just my opinion. So there are other people yeah, who might feel totally different. <laughs> I would say, yeah, over there in the channel, we could create more uh, sub-channels or sub-topics, huh? surely. Yeah. Uh, to have, you know, to have, yeah, to talk about those topics in more detail. But also, I would propose, yeah, let's uh, meet again and let's brainstorm because we get a lot of ideas mm -hmm. and uh, thoughts about the from these uh, sessions. I guess also today, what I heard, this was so amazing from all of you. Excellent. So I it's just the first kickoff. Yeah, of course absolutely. we won't be able to solve anything, but yeah, let's continue on the channel. Let's gather again and see how far we get. Absolutely. Okay. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, guys. And also for Alex, thank you. Yeah. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Great, great, great discussion. Exactly. Bye-bye. Thanks.